Well, hello everyone. It is uh, Brave Days and today we are doing an author chat. My name is Erin Gallagher, program manager for This Is My Brave, trying to get my little sign in here so you all know where I come from. And I am joined today by two authors who are a part of this Brave community with us. And um, so we're gonna take a minute to chat with them, find out about their books, and a little bit more just about themselves too. But just as a moment of full disclosure, I just want you to know, since it is Brave Days, it's Mental Health Awareness Month, I just want everybody to know that I am feeling all this anxiety about having this conversation today and it doesn't make any sense. And five minutes ago, I was trying to think of 27 different ways not to do this. And then I thought, what's the big deal? Just go do it, who cares? You're a loving community. You can handle the fact that it might not be perfect. And so um, just wanted to share that with you because I know that we all have those moments where we just are like, ah, what have I done? Why did I say yes to this? And we want to back out, but then sometimes barreling through is the right thing to do. And I am sure at the end of this conversation, I will uh, be grateful that I did. So um, thanks for hanging with me and, um, and being witness to my brave today. <laughs> so with us today, we have Olivia and Jason. We'll start with you, Olivia, because you were a part of our inaugural This Is My Brave show. Is that right? That is right. I was one of the lucky ones who got in the door <laughs> early so, on. You know, we just um, all got a little blip on our phone yesterday, um, reminding us that it, yesterday was the anniversary of the very first show. Oh, was it? Okay. You didn't get that blip? <laughs> uh, God, no. I'm so inundated. Don't take it. This is my brave. Don't take it personally. No, that's okay. <laughs> that's awesome. So, yeah. Uh, on this day or yesterday, um, so many years ago, you were part of that first show. Will you first just tell me, um, since this is my brave, had barely the idea was just kind of in Jen and Anne Marie's mind at that point. How did mm -hmm. you hear about this is my brave um, to well, be able to come become a part of it? Yeah, it was it was a, a series of awesome coincidences. So um, I was freelance writing at the time, um, and I had started to write about mental health, um, particularly how it relates to parenting and how um, being an anxious mom, just like kind of putting it all out there, pretty much just like this is my brave would do. Um, and I had a local friend who knew Jen personally, I think like she went to college with her husband, something, I forget exactly what the connection is, but yeah. she said, oh, you need to follow Jen Marshall, and pretty much that same month I saw auditions for This Is My Brave, and um, yeah, I just went for it, and it was awesome. So uh, yeah, it really worked out. So I'm in the D.C. area, um, so I was lucky to be close by, and just, I, I think I had just started writing about anxiety, so I was very much riding that wave, and I think probably like a lot of people who do uh, participate in This Is My Brave you know, that first time you put something out in the world is like a little yeah. scary. Um, but the, everything you get back from putting it out in the world, like the response from readers of my articles and everything has been so, has really strengthened me and encouraged me. And so it was one of the best decisions I ever made to start writing about it and to audition for This Is My Brave. Um, because I know I was making other people feel less alone and in return they made me feel a lot there less alone. There it is. There it mm -hmm. is. That's a new um, piece that we're really kind of emphasizing is the reciprocity of uh, what the brave experience is. It's about mm -hmm. giving and receiving. So even though you're the one up there theoretically inspiring, I, I think you find yourself also being inspired by the process. So absolutely. And, and I'm just amazed at how many people are anxious, you know, yeah, when yeah. I'm when I'm open about it. I'm like, yeah. Oh, you too, huh? So, and then I feel like, okay, now I can disclose that, like, I'm really anxious about the bathroom, and can you point out where it is just because I need to know at all times? And <laughs> that might be an awkward thing to disclose, but um, I, we've taken some of the awkward out of it. I'm already yeah. kind of out there, um, but I'm we'll definitely... We'll replace the, that A word, awkward, with the other A word, authentic. It's just the truth. There you go. It is. That's, it's your reality. I like that substitution. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, let's do it. Every time you want to say awkward, let's just say authentic, which, you know... That's good work. Thank right. you. I'm going to take that with me. Thank you. Sure, sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, so your piece, obviously, I'm guessing, addressed um, anxiety? 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. so um, my piece was called My Life Shrinking Problem, and it was specifically about the um, period of my life when it kind of went zero to 60, um, panic disorder with agoraphobia um, and OCD. Um, and it really did just like come out of nowhere and I had no idea what it was. I didn't have the vocabulary for it. I didn't know anxiety could feel like that, um, everything. And what it felt like to me was that I had once been living this full life and it had basically gotten whittled down until the only place I was comfortable was like between my bed and my bathroom because I was so worried about the bathroom that I would even be anxious being all the way under the covers because I would feel like I couldn't get there fast Ooh, enough. Wow. Um, so like my life shrunk down significantly. Um, and so I kind of say that my constant pro pro like progress that I'm always trying to make is to keep it from shrinking to that point while oh, you know, still giving myself some grace. Like I don't like taking the Metro. Okay. You know, being <laughs> underground don't. and like it's <laughs> shut down. Exactly. Right. And so, you know, I had a really hardcore therapist who was like, no, you have to do everything you're afraid of. But I was like, you know what, if I don't take the Metro for the rest of my life, it's okay. Yeah. Um, I but... mean, I guess if it was your single passage to um, like safety, you know, maybe that would change. Things. I could do it. I think yeah. I could do it. And the other thing I've realized, and this is a whole other topic as my four year old walks in. Do you want to say hi? Hi. Oh, yes. We love four year olds. <laughs> he wasn't supposed oh, to interrupt hi. me. This is How Rowan. He has a watermelon eye patch on. I like um, that eye patch. That's pretty cool. It's actually, this was actually, he can't hear you because I have headphones on. Okay. Okay. You got to go downstairs with dad though. Okay. Love you. Um, I was going to say, this is, uh, especially writing about parenting and anxiety. Another thing I realized is that when I'm focused, when I'm focused on my kids and getting them through tough things, my anxiety just goes away. Oh, that's interesting. Um, and so I've been really trying to sort of channel that. And like when I'm, when I'm in a nurturing place, I had a panic attack recently and this guy right here completely melted down and threw like a screaming on the floor of a hotel lobby, mm. like kicking and screaming. I had to pick him up out of there. Yeah. But you know what I realized? As soon as I had to do that, mm. I wasn't thinking about myself at all. Oh, interesting. <laughs> like I, was, yeah. I was no longer worried about like, am I going to throw up at this moment? I was just like, I need to get the screaming child out of here. So, yeah. Thank you for that. Thank you, Rowan. So Olivia, your book that we're excited to share with the readers today, or the readers, the viewers today, um, it is not about mental illness or your not. particular anxiety. So it's not, it's not a memoir. No, no, it's fiction. It's young adult fiction. Um, well, it doesn't deal with mental health. Um, I have written stories. They're just not out yet. I do okay. have I do have an agoraphobia what young adult book that's about art and agoraphobia yeah. and okay. um, deals with some selective nudism things like that. Uh, not published yet. Okay. But this book, I like to think that the bridge between mental health work and this is um, just the idea of honesty and authenticity. It's probably yeah. a perfect word because these characters, I've got it right here. I realize I have a I have a poster back there. Um, it's called The Birds, the Bees, and You and Me. Yeah, it's like shiny. There we go. I, like um, it. I don't know if you can see the cover. There's like some birth control pills mm -hmm. and tampons and condoms. And yeah. so you can kind of guess what it might deal with. It deals with sex ed. Um, but it's fiction. I I, that's not how I was expecting that. I was expecting nonfiction, sexual information. I know. No. Okay. But there's a lot of information in there. So my yeah. my hope with this book is that maybe kids who don't have access to comprehensive sex ed and feel really awkward about asking questions or, oh, yeah. you know, any kind of acquired information are going to read this fun story about three friends getting ready to go to college and navigating first romance and all that stuff. But really these characters are empowered to talk about their own experiences openly. Um, there's a great deal of talk about consent and, mm -hmm. um, you know, being, being willing to be open with your sexual partners all that stuff is kind of wrapped in there. Um, so my real hope is that, you know, like teenagers read it and um, maybe feel empowered to ask questions, talk to their friends, not feel so much of a taboo around talking about sex. And right. so I think you can easily carry that stuff to This Is My Brave because it really Empowering. is about talking about tough stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we always talk exactly. about people being empowered to, to speak openly Mm -hmm. So there, we're already just fill out, fill in yep. the blank about yep. blank. Just, you know, we right. say mental illness, we may, we say addiction, you say sexuality or, um, mm -hmm. you know, questions about sex. That's cool. Mm -hmm. 
Yep. That's really neat. I really wasn't expecting you to say fiction for a second. I, know, I, was, I was like, looking... she just said fiction. That's an error. <laughs> yeah, it really is fiction. I write, yeah. So, um, and like I said, I really do want to write. I do want to tackle stuff like anxiety and mental health. Um, and there are a lot of good, there are like, I'm in the kid lit world, but there are so many good books coming out all the time that deal with mental health, especially in teenagers and children. And so I'm just really encouraged by the amount of stories that are just out there that weren't there 10 years ago. Yeah. Well, it's needed, right? I mean, it, it's, it, it is one way to start a conversation in that um, it comes, you know, I think a lot of ideas come from books and kids can go to the library. This is the wonderful thing about reading is it exposes kids to worlds that they don't, or all of us to worlds that we don't have immediate access to and it mm -hmm. orients us to that and maybe opens up our minds or creates curiosity where we go search for other things. I think that's amazing. So that was released in 2019 and it's going strong. Yep. I mean, it's YA is a very fast paced world. I wish yeah. I had another book out. I don't. Yeah. It's doing fine. I'm very, you know, I'm very happy with it. I'm also, I really want to write picture books, books that my yeah. kids can read. Yeah. You know, I kind of want to do it all. So um, just trying to live that creative life. Cool. Well, Katie's with us watching. Um, the other program manager with This Is My Brave, and she's dropped in some links in the chat there. Thank you, Katie. So there are some resources <laughs> if, if folks want to go check it out. Thanks, Katie, for doing that. And um, so let's turn our attention to Jason. Jason, welcome to the show. And um, will you just give us a little introduction about yourself? Hey, yeah, it's great to be here. So um, I'm really new to This Is My Brave. Uh, coming aboard earlier this year, uh, got connected through a mutual friend, and uh, it's just been an incredible experience. Last year, I came to terms with an eating disorder that I had battled for over 15 years. And uh, as a male battling orthorexia, which probably a lot of people out there are like, what is orthorexia? Yeah. Um, I, I felt very alone. I felt very isolated. And I decided that I needed to share my story to help other guys out there and other individuals who are battling those lesser known eating disorders to uh, help confront the stigma and the stereotypes around those things. And uh, I launched my blog earlier this year. And uh, the first connection I made after launching the blog was with Jen and This Is My Brave. And uh, it's just been an incredible experience to be able to be a part of something so empowering and so inspiring. So um, I think you need to help us understand what orthorexia is. Just um, I know it sounds like an eating disorder, but it, 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 is a, it has a very specific definition that many people watching may not really know what it is. So can you help us understand? Totally. Yeah, I myself didn't even know what it was, and I had battled it for 15 years or so. It's basically, though, an addiction to healthy eating. So a lot of times with an eating disorder, an individual is obsessed with simply their body image or worried about calories in and calories out. With orthorexia, it was more about eating organic food all the time or eating clean foods. Um, a lot of fad diets that are out there where they cut food groups such as carbs or limit the fats. Uh, those types of fad diets can feed into orthorexia because I found myself labeling foods good or bad. and. As time wore on, as the disease, as the condition got worse, um, more foods were on the bad list and less foods were on the good list. Hmm. And that ended up causing me to lose a lot of weight. Even though that was not my intention, uh, that was kind of a side effect of that addiction to just clean, healthy eating. And s you said you dealt with this for 15 years. Yeah, yeah. So I was wow. overweight as a child mm -hmm. and uh, kind of developed an unhealthy relationship with food in high school uh, when I had lost the weight. Um, I used that kind of as my crowning achievement. I thought that solely based upon what I was eating is how I could value myself, how other mm -hmm. people valued me. And um, over time, it got worse and worse. And then I had a scare with colon cancer uh, when I was 29 years old. And at that point, that's when it, the orthorexia just kind of went through the roof because I thought, I don't want to die. I want to live as long as I can. And I went online. And of course, it's stop eating red meats and eat this and oh, eat boy. that. Yeah. And I became so obsessed trying to be healthy that I was actually being unhealthy. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of like that seed was planted as a, as a young kid, as a high schooler, that there was this kind of unhealthy relationship with food. 
But then all it took was that health scare uh, a couple of years ago that really just ignited the flames of orthorexia. So you've written a book and is this more like a memoir or is it more informational? Help me understand. Yeah, so it is a memoir and um, I'm really excited, Starving for Survival. It will be out okay. in August. So it's still, it's crazy for me to think that it's actually going to be published. It's one of those where I kind of have to pinch myself. Just being here today right now, mm -hmm. I just, Talking about I'm an author. Like it's, it's yeah, crazy to think go. about that, but <laughs> it's, it's a pretty incredible feeling. But yeah, it, it chronicles my entire journey from childhood. Um, it actually started as what I thought was just going to be a blog post about eating at McDonald's and getting a Happy Meal when I was five years old. And it just morphed into something a lot bigger than that. I uh, addressed the loss of losing my parents at a young age. Both of them passed away while I was in my teen years. And that led to a lot of um, turmoil within the family and broken relationships between me and my siblings. Um, I dealt with homelessness and arrest and just went through some really, really dark times along the way. And all the while, I kind of clung to the eating disorder for stability. And this book just covers it all. I really leave no stone left unturned. Uh, I embrace my vulnerability and just went with it. So when I wear this shirt that says Brave the Storm, um, that's basically what Starving for Survival, my book, will be about. It's just the storm that I went through and uh, how I survived. Yeah, so just to... Uh, Jason's helping us um, to work out the logistics of Brave the Storm, which is just a quick plug because you got you did this mm -hmm. earlier with Jen, right? Yeah. Yep. So yeah. So Brave the so, Storm. Go ahead and you give us the quick pitch on Brave oh, the Storm. Oh, yeah. 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 So it's just uh, June 11th through the 13th. It's uh, a virtual 5K event. So you can run, you can hike, you can swim, bike, whatever you want to do. Uh, it's free to register. Just Go on the website, uh, sign up to participate, join us for an opening and closing ceremony. I think it's just a great opportunity for us to all get together. Um, I, I said it earlier with Jen too, this is about much more than people with just eating disorders or people that are battling mental illness and mental health. This is for everybody. We all have insecurities. We all have things we need to talk about. And uh, I hope that this weekend is an opportunity for individuals across the country to do just that, to have the conversations uh, they need to have while getting physically active with their friends. Yeah, like it. So um, it just, it sounds like the two of you, you know, uh, Katie had put together all these author chats and she, and she had the big puzzle of like, who gets to go when and with whom. And um, so it sounds like, I'm gonna say that the piece that connects the two of you is that at the, at the center of the conditions that you talk about is an anxiety, maybe not the same kind of anxiety, right? But it seems like each of your, more explicitly, Olivia, yours, definitely anxiety, but Jason, it sounds like yours rooted from an anxiety or many multiple anxieties as well. Yeah, absolutely, mm -hmm. absolutely. When I was listening to Olivia's um, speech, it was just, it resonated within me because I thought of myself sitting at a restaurant and how much fear and anxiety I would have opening up that menu. Usually I would spend hours researching restaurants before I'd even go there. But then just the thought of having to explain to somebody across the table that that loaf of bread is giving me anxiety, that I'm scared mm. to death of that bread. And I think regardless of what we're facing, we can relate on that level because I could feel it in Olivia when she was talking about it. Uh, that's the same level of anxiety that I felt in my situations. I think it sounds like the obsessive component is pretty, pretty clear. Now, when I finally took medication, um, that was one of the first things that sort of quieted. And I did not realize how much bandwidth in my brain that took up all the time. And I have to imagine it's the same with you. I mean, you know, you're faced with meal times. How, I'm at, how many ever times a day? Like, it's, you can't escape it, right? So it's right. kind of... My OCD was a lot about, I mean, I definitely had a good deal of food issues uh, thrown in there because of my own like digestive issues and focusing on the bathroom. I had, I had quote unquote safe foods. Mm -hmm. um, so <laughs> that was very limited and I also lost weight. Um, so I relate a lot to what you're saying um, mm -hmm. for sure. I don't know if I talked about that in my talk, but really it was like I would eat oatmeal for breakfast and potatoes for lunch. Oh, wow. And I was like, that was it. 
<laughs> not the yeah. not the most balanced. <laughs> Yeah, it almost sounds like we were exchanging diet tips back then because uh, that's very similar <laughs> to what I was eating. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, um, you know, and it's just, I, I think that's the part that people who have never had any sort of obsessive anxiety component have a really hard time understanding why you can't just, like, turn it off. Um, and I feel like this is a place where storytelling is so important because it is hard to imagine that. Yeah. Um, it seems like something you should be able to talk yourself out of, um, and it's not. It's just like a constant barrage, um, a, a loop that you can't get out of. Um, and well, so I I'm really grateful when stories capture that. Yeah. I think um, that's an important thing for anybody who's watching to understand that, um, you know, we wa we wa often want to tell ourselves just to snap out of stuff, right? Like, come on, I can do better. And then we continue to face the same thing. So it's interesting to me that you say that with medication that helped to quiet things. Surely you had tried yourself to just get over it probably many times. Yeah. I mean, for me, especially it was trying to figure out what was wrong with me. I didn't think it was a mental illness. Mm -hmm. um, I remember Googling I thought I had some sort of passing out disorder because one of my fears was passing out and I would feel so close to it. I didn't have the heart palpitations, those kinds of panic attacks that a lot of people have trouble breathing. Mine was very emotional dissociation and like stomach problems um, and feeling like I'm gonna throw up. So I thought for sure something was wrong with those systems and I was just looking for answers. And I will never forget, I've, I've written about this before, I went into a Planned Parenthood to get birth control and there was a little checkbox, are you experiencing anxiety? And like a light bulb went off. Oh. Had I not gone in there and had that just, you know, screener, I was just there for birth control. But they asked me about my mental health and they were the one, they knew the no cost therapy. Um, mm -hmm. So that's always my, if you don't know where to start looking for help, this is like my thing I tell a lot of young people, Planned Parenthood, they're pretty hooked into a lot of, a lot of those, um, things I was able to go see somebody who was in training to be a psychologist. Um, okay. And so all of our sessions were overseen by this person's teacher. Um, but it was, it was just a low, it was a very low cost um, option. And it was, I mean, I, it, it made all the difference for me. She didn't want me to try medication because she really wanted me to retrain my brain. But I remember I saw a general practitioner who was like, Oh honey, just, maybe you just need a little more serotonin in there <laughs> floating around and it did help, but it was definitely like the two together um, that finally helped me. But it, yeah, the, the, um, you know, the mood stuff took a little longer to take effect, but it, it was the, the, the volume was just turned down hmm. really quickly. Um, that's and that's nice. how I knew I was on the right track. Yeah. yeah. I feel like I was lucky in that case. Yeah. Well, I've done the retrain your brain stuff. Um, with no medication assisting and it is okay. a thing that you have mm -hmm. to practice at all times and so you mean like you can't it's not like soccer where you can just go for an hour practice three times a week and really build your skills I mean mm -hmm. you go see the you know your therapist they give you the tools and then like sitting at a stoplight when you start to go you have to do the little exercise and mm -hmm. you know and when you're not sleeping at night and your head's going you have to do the exercise i mean you have to really but i can say that if you're committed to the practice that does it does work it does mm -hmm. work it just is mm -hmm. you have to persistently go after it and there's really no downtime while you're working on it i will say the downtime does arrive when you've been successful um but it's it is work so, um, mm -hmm. Jason, in you terms of your um, wellness today, I mean, you're here, you, you look like you're thriving and doing great. So, um, like, what was the key to your, like, like, do you have a turnaround point in your recovery that you can point to? Yeah, so for me, it was um, difficult because I was kind of the same way where I didn't think I really had a mental illness, where I didn't think I had an eating disorder. I just figured everybody kind of felt that obsession about healthy eating because, when you're out and about, people will be like, oh, I'm going to be bad tonight and have dessert or something like right. that. So I didn't really think I needed help. And um, then I had a breakdown um, at dinner one night. They couldn't substitute the pita bread for vegetables. And I freaked out. I just wanted to go home. I didn't want to eat. 
And luckily my husband called me out on it. He was like, you, I see your pain. I see your hurt from your childhood. It wasn't necessarily about the eating disorder. It was about just this pain and the suffering that I had been keeping inside for so long. And um, it opened my eyes. So I went to the doctor the following week and that's where I was diagnosed with anxiety, OCD, and at that point, an unspecified eating disorder because with orthorexia, it's not yet a formal diagnosis. So it was just called an unspecified eating disorder, which to me sounded made up. I didn't really think it was that big of a problem still. And I asked my doctor, who, who do I talk to about treatment? What do I do next? And he didn't even know. He didn't mm. know any resources for someone like me going through an unspecified eating disorder, who to reach out to. So I had to do it all myself. And um, I was able to connect with a therapist who said he didn't know anything about eating disorders. He hadn't worked with clients in the past about eating disorders, but that he could talk me through the pain of losing my parents and my fears of my own health and my anxiety. And it was through those conversations that we were able to address the eating disorder. So I think a lot of times people will just assume, oh, an eating disorder, the only way you gotta fix it is to get on a diet plan but that's not it. There's so much more underneath the surface going on. And it's through those open and honest conversations that I was finally able to work through things that needed to be addressed over the past two decades that finally gave me the tools to fight my eating disorder. And it was ironic enough because it was through writing my own story that I was able to, that was my turning point. That's when I was able to realize that this was a lot bigger than me, that I was simply doing the best I could and I could forgive myself for years gone by. And um, that was the turning point, was just being able to change the perspective, change the objective on my own story, and gain that self-compassion to be able to just fully embrace recovery. My mantra in my recovery journal is to trust the process, embrace the process, and eventually enjoy the process. Ooh, and I'm happy it. to That's say, funny. yeah, eventually <laughs> enjoy it. And I will say right now, this conversation we're having, this is an example of enjoying the process. Okay, yeah, this definitely yeah. is enjoyable. Yeah. Okay, yeah. yeah, I agree. Okay, and now um, Katie dropped into the chat box your, it's pushed off the side. Let me just read what it says. Oh, orthorexia bites, which is the funniest website. And talk about enjoying you know, you've kind of <laughs> yeah. put a little spin and on it i like that um exactly and, so and they're on your website what what kind of resources do you share there yeah so i even use the donut as the uh, o for <laughs> orthorexia so that's our logo because oh, that's, that's just funny. perfect donuts are like they were the forbidden food and now they're like my favorite so i love it but um so on orthorexia bites i've got a blog where i just keep people up to date on my journey um, you know, there's some days that are good, there's some days that are bad. And I feel like on social media, a lot of times people will only post the good stuff. Right. And I post it all, I keep it real. So if I'm having a bad day, I, I'll go ahead and share it in that blog. Uh, there's also resources for several books that have helped me out through recovery. Um, there's links about information just on orthorexia because a lot of people don't know what orthorexia yeah. is. And then one thing that I've really started trying to work on now as the blogs got going is working with men because there's such a stigma about yes. sharing our emotions and getting out behind the mask. I, I tell everybody now that I was wearing a mask long before the pandemic because yeah, I was, I was hiding everything inside and just saying, oh, it's fine, I'm good because that's yeah. what I thought a strong man did. Mm -hmm. And now I've realized that a strong man is the one who's vulnerable and who is yeah. open and who shares his emotions. So that's another thing now through Orthorexia Bites that um, I'm starting to promote a lot through the blog and through the website. Cool. Well, I'm thrilled that I got over my little anxiety moment and came to have this conversation with the two of you. It's been really wonderful talking to both of you. And I'm a huge fan of YA books and I kind of feel like, um, I don't know. I I like the stories. Tons of great YA books out there. So I'm really excited to read your book. And Thank you. Yeah, and recommend it possibly. I'll let you know if after I read it, but I'm sure. <laughs> um, I can't wait. And um, Jason, when your book comes out, I really am interested in learning more. Um, I would encourage everybody to um, check out the resources we have in the chat. Thanks to Katie. Go listen to Olivia's um, story on from the original show, the very first This Is My Brave show. And um, 
perhaps she will connect, her story will connect a little bit with you too. Um, so thank you so much, both of you for joining us. And also one last plug for uh, Brave the Storm. If you, uh, whatever it is, whatever your storm is, 2021, it's a virtual event. So you can do it with uh, 10 friends, follow the guidelines of your state, of course, you can do it. <laughs> or just do it on your own, wear your shirt, people like your shirt and ask you about it. Um, and take pictures, share, hashtags, all of that. Thank you so much for your time today, everyone. And um, Olivia, Jason, thank you for boy being with thank us. Thank you yes, so thank much. Thank you. It was nice to meet you both. Yes. Good to meet you too. And I hope to see you in person soon one day, maybe at a show mm -hmm. in your area. I would love that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs>